Well, it's great to be back up here in the the Bay Area again, seeing old friends and new friends, and we just, this is kind of a spontaneous trip, so thank you for coming together on short notice, rather short notice. Uh, I felt that this would be a very spontaneous year for me, and so uh, I just called Nikita up not long ago from Mexico and said, hey, you want to meet me in California? She said, yeah. So we've just come up from Southern California. And when I was down there, it just dawned on me that, yeah, I kind of come full circle. 25 years ago was when I started just trusting Jesus and going out and hitting the road and going wherever to a lot, meeting a lot of new people and going to a lot of new places. And Los Angeles was one of those. And it was 25 years ago that I came up through the Southwest and and then up here to the Bay Area. So I'm reenacting something very spontaneously that I've done before, just coming and shining and sharing and trusting. And it feels absolutely wonderful, just these gatherings coming together so spontaneously and I call them like Chautauquas, where we just, they're like talks of enlightenment, of waking up to our true self and realizing who we are. So, yeah, it feels wonderful to be here. And, yeah, it was, it's been a very good trip. We, we were taken in by a group of young people on a mountain when we, when we were down in, in the L.A. area, Topanga Canyon. So that was a lot of fun kind of just to be right in the middle of a community and uh, feel all the love and welcome. So, coming out here, it just feels very wonderful and just want to be very available to open myself up to any questions you have or topics and that usually the time flies by so fast when we start to get into these very deep Course in Miracles topics and to the healing, and yeah, a lot of our discussions have been very deep and and uh, relating to beliefs and and thoughts and how when we give our lives over, they become very transparent expressions of the One, and they become so guided that everything feels very easy and involuntary and there's no sense of trying to figure anything out. A state of acceptance and there's a sense of peace with that acceptance. Every moment is new. It's like meeting yourself for the very first time with no reference of a past. And therefore every moment is very fresh and clean and crisp and clear and you feel open and, and a strong sense of innocence with that as well. And so, yeah, it's just wonderful to come together in the joining of coming to that innocence and coming to feel really good about who you are and who everyone is, letting go of all the negativity, the attack thoughts. Yes? How did you get into the Course? Myself? I came to California about five years prior to these travels and I was out at a humanistic psychology conference. It was Carl Rogers' last uh, speaking engagement. And there was a lot of Francis Vaughn and a lot of transpersonal psychologists out there and I had planned to go to a number of talks and then I went down where the psychologists were selling their their CDs and DVDs and books and so forth, and I began talking to two students of A Course in Miracles that were students of Tara Singh. And so I started canceling a lot of the programs <laughs> that I had intended to go to, because I kept being drawn down to the same table every day, intuitively, and, uh, and there was a videotape playing, and Tara Singh was speaking of things that I had like realizations I'd come to and insights, but I'd never spoken them to anyone. So it was almost like they would be spoken back to me. 
And I said, this is amazing. So then I went to South Burnside Avenue where they have their Foundation for Life Action. I ended up buying a course, A Course in Miracles, Tara Singh's book, Nothing Real Can Be Threatened, and Ken Wapnick's book, Forgiveness in Jesus. So I had the course and two nice little companions to go along with it. And uh, yeah, it felt like kind of like going to that uh, Foundation for Life Action. It was like that, uh, that TV show, This Is Your Life. The, the photos on the walls, the people I met, the sayings, everything went into slow motion. Like it was like a calling kind of thing, like, ah, doesn't matter what you've ever done in your life or where you've been, it's going to all be different from this point. And so I went back eventually to Cincinnati and, and had a huge immersion of reading the book for about eight hours a day on the average for two and a half years of using it almost like an oracle, was answering so many questions just <laughs> by popping it open. So, yeah, that's how it happened in 1986. So, so it's 30 year anniversary for me with the course and 25 years out on the road with uh, just listening to Jesus guide me where to go, what to do, putting words in my mouth and, um, yeah, convincing me of, of holiness, of all of our holiness and all of our innocence. So it's been a really great ride. And then we've had some amazing, and Nikita came, came calling, came visiting when you were about 29, came out to Utah. Yeah. This almost four years ago. Four years ago. Um. And then to, before this trip, she just felt so much energy, like she just couldn't sleep, she had all this energy, like she had to give it away and extend it. So she was praying out loud when I called her and said, why don't we go to California? And she's like, yes! Because <laughs> she felt like she was going to explode. So she needed this <laughs> road trip. <laughs> so we would love to get into any kind of areas or topics or anything. We live very transparent lives. Uh, like Sundari said, uh, it, it became apparent that the key to forgiveness, and you might say making the conditions of the mind ripe to accept this great gift of forgiveness, that, uh, that is a, a gift It's different than traditional forgiveness, and it's, it's really seeing the impossibility of, of wrongness, the impossibility of error, taking us beyond interpreting meaning in bodies as if bodies could do anything wrong, or anything right, for that matter. As if this world could contain anything positive or negative, for that matter. You know, it's a, it's a system of like emptying the mind, clearing the mind of all debris, and uh, really having no other goal other than the peace of mind, the peace of God. And so, it was just the young people down in, in Topanga, Kenya were asking for like tips on practicing the workbook and and diving deeper into devotion and and yeah that's we there was a lot of talk about devotion of just being very single pointed and and then just letting the spirit go before you with everything providing everything you need um, it, when the course says forget this world forget this course and come with open arms unto your God it really means that you have to come into a place of stillness where you don't value anything of this world at all. No skills, no abilities, no seeming possessions, or the very concept of possession, the idea that we could possess anything. And so, to the ego it seems very radical, but my experience has been, as I've just given myself fully over, that it feels very natural. I even met a uh, the, the mother of the man who invited me to Topanga Canyon, and she, I think, had been diagnosed with attention deficit disorder, and after she heard me talk, talk for a couple hours, I was laughing and sharing happiness and joy, and she said, that's, 
that's the way I live. It's it's just this diagnosis that tells me <laughs> I've got something going wrong in my life. And I said, yeah, it's, that's the thing. Any kind of judgment that we hold about ourselves or about any person or anything in the world is like diagnosing ourselves as something other than a child, a perfect child of God. So, yeah, I can see how the Spirit has used my education, my travels, and ten years of university, and all kinds of things, just to, you could say, they're just like symbols that are pointing and expressing a, a life of so much happiness, and so much joy, and so much connection, that is very, very natural. It's not like you don't have to really do anything to achieve it, or attain it. It's more like it's just getting out of the way, and becoming more humble, and more humble, and more humble, and coming to rest in a state of, of natural beingness. And everything's given, even the words, even these words are, are just given. It's the desire, too, that everything you think and say and do teaches all the universe, so you want to bless the universe with everything you think, say and do. That's what a child of God does. It's a part of our creation, is to be a blessing and in this world, it comes out in terms of letting the, the light shine through you in what seems to be uh, cleaning and clearing your perception, clearing all the debris away. So it's been, it's been a beautiful journey. So do you feel like you have a shortened path to forgiveness, or do you feel like you've moved beyond really the need for forgiveness because you are actually judging in the first place? I would say that forgiveness is very, very natural, and um, I was just telling them at lunch today, I, I was in Mexico was a couple years ago, and this, they had this quantum machine that was telling me all kinds of things, and the two ladies that were administering the test, um, I said, I'll, I'll go in there by this machine, but they actually, one of the questions for the machine was, what percentage of David's life pur purpose has he accomplished? And the machine said, 100%. And they said, well, we've never seen that in all the years we've been administering this test. But, but the 100% is, is more a state of complete trust and relaxation. It's really the trust uh, that goes hand in hand with the forgiveness. When you're trusting, uh, like it says in the Course, the Holy Spirit will go before you and make straight your path and leave no stones to trip on or obstacles to bar your way. And that's kind of a, a surreal, kind of a fairy tale kind of life. And, and after uh, I kind of went through some things of, of pride and not willing to accept things, thinking I had to earn things, and do things on my own. There was, those were the most difficult lessons at the beginning, uh, when I didn't have a job, and I didn't know how I would be provided for in form, but I felt I was told, just trust me and I will go before you and make it very clear. Those were the most difficult times, it was letting go of the past conditioning, and uh, letting go of the Protestant work ethic, and letting go of idea of savings, the idea of earning, um, the idea of, of trying to be practical in the ways that I had been programmed to be practical, and just giving over to present trust, and practicing, not knowing what would happen, but trusting, and keep trusting and not knowing. So I would say that um, forgiveness is something that is a living experience that's in my heart, uh, I have enjoyed in recent years, too, just symbols of, of those that are practicing forgiveness. Some of you know of, of Ho'oponopono and Dr. Hugh Lin, who lives out here in California. And before he would have a retreat, he would look at the names of everyone who was coming on the list to clean <laughs> his mind. <laughs> That's, a, that's almost like a pre-forgiveness. Yes, yes. <laughs> Before you meet the people, forgive the people. <laughs> Let go of everything you think you know. Even about a name, if you have a reaction to a name, okay, forgive, clean that one, clear that one. I, I like the thoroughness 
of that. I feel that forgiveness is whole and complete. And um, somebody asked me at lunch today, you know, about about if I had any negative thoughts or anything, and I said, no, actually, I haven't. I haven't had a bad day for. It's been so many years. I don't even remember uh, when my bad day was. My last bad day. It's it's very free flowing. It's equated in A Course in Miracle terms with the real world or true perception or the forgiven world or the happy dream. Jesus says it in many different ways. But it's just a state of non-judgment. Not that, that you've done, you've stopped the judgment, it's more, it's just the mind is very still. It doesn't have the static. That voice that was always judging and, and worrying and and sizing things up and whatever just got quieter and quieter over the years. It's more like it faded. It was still trying, like a little mouse squeaking over there occasionally, trying to draw some attention. But by pouring myself into the trust of the Spirit and just being guided and led in countless times, with floods of miracles over years and years and years, then the whole purpose of all that was to have a merge take place where you feel one with the Spirit, and you realize that you're not a body and neither is anybody else. You realize that, that you can't hold anything against anybody else, in a sense, because they're really, it's just one mind experiencing itself. It's a unified field of awareness. And so that's another way of describing forgiveness, the quantum field that they talk about in quantum physics, where everything's completely connected. So. That's been something that is involuntary and that just continually expresses, whether it's just in quietness of prayer or whether it's speaking. And I have to say that as I came into this year, that I've, yeah, I've had much more quiet time and uh, not really knowing what this year would bring. And then it just kind of came in a strong feeling to come here to California. And I know for you it was a big, big yes, that you were just waiting for that jump right in. I was waiting, but I didn't expect anything. <laughs> but you say something about happy surprises? Yeah, it was like, either it was the same day, it just felt like everything was so quick that I, I kept, I was like, hmm, I was sensing, there's this sense like, like, because everything got so quantum, everything, and ev there's like, all these reflections, like it's almost like we've been here before. It's like everything is just like, oh, I, I know, like I've seen this before, I've seen this before, and I was like, it's all the same, but something's different. And I'm like, there are happy surprises this time. Like expect happy, spontaneous surprises of the spirit. Like spirit is gonna throw something at us that is gonna be like, whoa, like whoa, where did that come from? And this, and so I went and I just told everyone. And uh, and at first there was a bit of like <gasps> fear because it's like happy surprises like in disguise like, as in like oh we don't want like like what are we supposed to wait for like a blessing in disguise or something like no 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 real surprises like you will not it's like you won't help but recognize them it's gonna be so mind blowing and so as soon as I said that and we celebrated we're like okay let, like let's be open. David calls and he's at, and, and it's like, would you like to come for a trip to California with me? Like right about now, I was like, I was like, yeah, I could. It's like, it was like wow, surprise. like that was a surprise, <laughs> and so, and so it was like in that kind of a, like that was the kind of vibe where it came from, and I was like, well, this is something out of, like, like out of this world. And then, needless to say, that like uh, all he said was, "We're just gonna meet in LA in a few days at 8:30. Meet me at LAX 8:30 a.m." I was like, "Okay," yeah. and then we'll just go where we go. Like, don't know. And then, uh, <laughs> within a day, everything got arranged. Like literally, like. It's like when you think like you know there's a tour you gotta coordinate. We even have a tour planner. 
so for these kinds of things and then within the day everything got arranged and then and Ricky was calling me she's like um well may I help you I was like I, I had the same thought but I have nothing for you it's like it's just doing everything is just being done by itself I don't know what's going on like so yeah that's fun I think a lot of us have, have always felt that we would like the spiritual journey to be fun, even though when the darkness coming, comes up, it's not experienced as fun. Uh, when the attack thoughts are passing through and those heavy, uh, dark feelings are passing through. But the hope is always there, and, and I have to say that uh, the spiritual awakening is really the experience of this beautiful teaching. From the, in the Bible it said, all things work together for good for those that love the Lord. And then in, in A Course in Miracles, Jesus kind of clarifies it even further. He really kind of firmly says, all things work together for good. There are no exceptions except in the ego's judgment. So it's like you're watching this swirl of images and there's not a sense that things could be different than they are. The wisdom of just seeing that all things are working together for good, uh, that's an another workbook lesson, is let all things be exactly as they are. He says it in a lot of different ways. But it's basically a sense of acceptance. You have no inclination, you have no ambition, uh, you have no desire to change the world, you have no desire to fix people, you have no desire for one political outcome, or another political outcome, or one economic outcome, or another economic outcome, or one ecological outcome, or another. It's, it's a state of acceptance. And it seems radical, but it's actually the most natural state that there is. It's actually fun to have no opinions about anything. It's actually fun to be able to, when somebody asks you a kind of a complicated intellectual question or something real scientific or whatever, to say, I don't know. And to feel wonderful about that, with a big smile on your face. I don't know. I don't care to know. <laughs> I'm not interested in knowing. Uh, do you have an opinion on this politician? No. Uh, we were at lunch today and the, the question came to Nikita, you know, like, oh, where's that accent from? Uh, oh, originally Russia, and this and this, and, oh, you know, have you been back? Yeah, a couple of visits, and uh, do you have, like, r relatives and friends and uh, relatives in Russia? No, they're all dead. <laughs> <She said. laughs> they're all dead. So, you know, it just, okay, well, it was very direct. <laughs> New train of thought, new uh, new direction there, but you know it was that very matter of fact. And I find that spirituality, the spirit, is very matter of fact. You know, your yeses mean yes, your noes mean no. Uh, you don't have all this wishy-washy hemming and hawing. It's it's quite simple, moment by moment. The yeses come out as yeses, and the noes come out as noes, and you have a big smile on your face with them, even with the noes. You know, it's not. There's nothing negative about no, uh, or positive about yes. It's the spirit can equally come in with either one, and the Bible said that. Let your yeas be yeas, let your nays be nays. Um, I don't quite know how to ask this, but uh, I have been involved for a number of years with a new school, and what I'm wondering is something about a course in miracles as applied to young children. Um, it's like, in some ways, they get it like their parents don't get it about how to be and how to live. Uh, but they are also incredibly susceptible to all the stuff that's whirling around that makes the ego what it is. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on, you know, is there, you know, anything to... You know, apply the Course in Miracles or the principles of it to them in their daily lives that would be beneficial to them? Or Yeah, I think ultimately it comes back to one's own mind training and one's following the guidance and, and not making exceptions. But yeah, children are, 
are symbols and mirrors, and they're amazing mirrors. And uh, I've always had a real kind of open uh, feel towards children in the sense that, like this uh, uh, gathering I did down in uh, Southern California, I think there was some discussion early on about can this woman, Krista, bring her baby? And uh, sometimes it's this thing about gatherings or satsangs or whatever about, you know, not having um, babies or crying babies or whatever. You don't see many videos of Muji with crying babies or, or Eckhart Tolle, you know, they, they just edit that out or they, they say, no, don't. it's not the time to have that in there. But uh, we had a baby and uh, two dogs uh, and, um, and the woman who brought her baby uh, was, was holding her baby and playing the guitar and singing at the same time. And the baby was just, it was calling on the Holy Spirit, invoking the Holy Spirit, and the baby was verbal and, and bouncing and almost like the dancing baby, like in Allie McBeal. Uh, it, it just, the baby was activated and, and everybody in the audience you could just see was just so connected. Their just faces just lit up with uh, this mother singing and the baby jumping and, and so verbal and everything. And then, and then of course, we, and the dogs were very much a part of the whole thing. You know, what it really is, is, is as we get so focused on peace of mind, when that becomes our priority and we have that out front, Jesus has a section called Setting the Goal, where he says, if you have the goal out front, you will perceive everyone and everything as helping you achieve that goal. So it's all inclusive, almost like you throw out like a big net and it just pulls everyone in and everyone plays their part perfectly. Every screech from the baby, every sound in the room, every bark from the dog, every question from a person, or every, every single thing that's going on is absolutely in divine order because of the purpose that's out front. And if you don't have that purpose out in front, then the ego just turns around and says, do I like this or not? It's just always judging things positively and negatively. Is it good? Is it bad? And it, it can be that. I mean, that's good mind training. If there's anybody in the room that had an issue with the baby or had an issue with the dog or the noise or anything, then that was just a, an opportunity for healing, just an opportunity to release it. So, I have worked with students years ago and oftentimes we would just go off on like a little camping trip and they would bring their children and you were right, they, a lot of times they had been listening to their parents talk about the Course for years and so they, the Spirit was using them uh, to help their parents again accelerate the healing. They wanted to go swimming. The parents didn't want them to go without supervision and they'd say, What's wrong? Do you think we're bodies? Are you afraid we'll drown? You know, it was like they've been listening to so much Course in Miracles for so many years, they just turned the screws in until the parents would just look at me and go, <laughs> you, know, like, you know, like, well, is this happening? What's happening here? And I just, I said, you know, this is, this is the healing. You have, this is putting it into application. It's, it's time to really apply it. And so we, you know, it was the whole little camping trip turned into this amazing thing. One year I was invited to Sweden, rural Sweden, to a farm by a group of parents. The children were there and they wanted to apply the principles to parenting. And so we did a whole parenting weekend in the sunshine in rural Sweden. And that's the only time I've done a, a gathering where actually I think it was the Maybe the cat um, gave birth. It was a parenting weekend, and there was there was a, a birth that took place at the end of the weekend. You know, almost like Jesus and the cosmic humor, like, oh, you know, here we'll throw this in too for you. We'll give you a birth. And so, it's important to apply it to everything in perception, and in many ways, children and indigo children and crystal children and a lot of the children that are coming now are reflections of it's time to let go of this egoic system. 
Uh, when I was in South America, in Argentina, I went out in the rural areas and a lot of mothers who were studying the Course came to see me one day and they said, we are learning so much from our young, very young children. And so I had translators and I said, please tell me what, if you could summarize the, the main lesson that the young ch children, the infants are teaching you, please tell me what it is. And basically in English it came down to, you're done. Uh, the children were saying to the parents, this game of inequality, of, of parents having more power or controlling children, this game is over. You are done. It is over. And that was like a new wave coming in. And they were thrilled because there's a lot of tension and fear and guilt and stress and worry tied in with believing you're responsible for these little bodies, believing that, that they're somehow inferior in some ways, just because developmentally and physically they seem to be underdeveloped, that has, says nothing about the mind that we share. It says nothing about the spirit that we share, that we are. So, yeah, I feel it, for children coming in, it's very important to include them in everything that you're dealing with in perception, and that just helps speed the, speed the process up. And they're amazing reflectors. Just like this weekend, that was amazing. The little baby, absolutely amazing. Have you ever done anything with teachers? Like a group of teachers? Yeah, in some senses. I mean, I've traveled and so <laughs> There are, have been gatherings where people have been pulled together. One time, um, I was in a, a hall, a big room with all, mostly all psychologists, and sometimes what? psychologists, a group of psychologists, and that was quite lively because a lot of conditioning with psychology that goes into being a professional psychologist is egoic, and um, so it was a very lively, lively session. I've done sessions with groups of new age people and kind of numerologists and tarot and it's just been fun and I think a lot of times too with all the travel I do and the places I go I do interact with Course in Miracles teachers that or they might call themselves even facilitators that just are wanting to join together on on in the purpose and look at the nuances, and where they have struggles. Um, one time I went to a course group and uh, there was a lot of, I walked into the group and there seemed to be all this divisiveness in the group. Um, and there was like an undercurrent of, of control and struggle in there. I could just feel it when I went into the room. And then um, they were going to vote on a set of bylaws for their course group. And uh, it's unusual. Uh, it, been to many groups I hadn't seen that one yet and then they were they were kind of back and forth arguing about the bylaws and so forth and I just I mean just sat and watched for a while and then finally some of the people said this guy David is here let's just see if he has anything to say and someone said no let's go back we have to end this conflict and vote on the bylaws and this and this you know it's everyone's teaching and learning all the time it's our thoughts. We're teaching and learning by our thoughts. And so, even the concept of teacher, or teacher of God, that Jesus refers to, that's a, a concept that, that will fall away as well. I don't, I don't hold any, any of those concepts in mind anymore. The Holy Spirit can give me words that can still address things in a way that people can relate to them and hear them. And certainly when I'm counseling with people, it just kind of comes through in the way that's most helpful. But there's no kind of uniform way, and, and those symbols can be there. But I don't, I don't hold those in my mind anymore. Uh, I don't think in terms of teachers and students. I think in terms of thoughts. And once I realize that, that all the beliefs of this world that generated time and space including all the seeming different belief systems that people share, are all equally false, then, huh, I could let all that go too. No need to try to figure out what somebody believes or... 
there's no need to make a point, no need to defend anything. Um, that's why I, I always say, you know, as I go around, I'm just as happy with atheists as I am with Christians or with scientists or Hindus or it doesn't really, Muslims, it doesn't really matter to me at all. Because I'm, I'm in the experience of our connectedness, so I see that those things can get used as symbols, but they, they don't really mean anything. So maybe someday I'll get invited to, you know, like an atheist convention or something to Atheists Unite or something like. Wouldn't surprise me if that happens. I would be very happy to go to Atheists Unite. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, can you talk a little bit along the lines of how to, about differentiating between guidance and ego and control? Yeah, it's, well, we learned from Jesus in the Course that this is a world of judgment, and so the escape from this world and the giving up of judgment comes through the Holy Spirit. So while the mind believes in duality, while it believes in opposites, then the Holy Spirit has to be judgmental to reach that mind. Because the light is so abstract, and the, the sleeping mind, the judgmental mind, doesn't can't can't relate to abstraction anymore. So, so really guidance, the difference between guidance and, and the ego is that, that guidance is the, the Holy Spirit's inspired use of symbols, inspired use of words. You might say A Course in Miracles is a very inspired use of words. A lot of uh, Shakespearean blank verse, uh, even though when I travel around the world, they, I just take all the complaints about the book you know, what are these double negatives, and why does he have to speak in such a thick language, and, and masculine pronouns, and you know, the, the world has its own reactions. But it's, I don't know, I, I thought, when I first got the, came in contact with the Course, I opened it up and I went, well, there's the last book on the planet. That's the last book I'll ever read. Uh, I felt that right away, I thought. And then when somebody said, are you going to write books, I said, heavens no. Look at this, <laughs> what you need to have, have a masterpiece like this, you know, it's like, what do you need books for? So when I, at lunch today, when I was leaving, um, we were in the parking lot, and, and the, one of the Course of Miracles teacher facilitators we met with was saying, David, how many books have you written? I said, none, because uh, I don't write books, I speak. I just show up and let the Spirit pour through me and everything, and then people record it, and transcribe it and put it into books. But I never said sat down. I said years ago, I said, I have no desire to write a book after the course. I said, that's enough. It's enough of it. That's got to be the last book I'll ever read. And it, you know, it's so good that I, it's like, if you've got something that's so good, why would you try to improve on it? Or sometimes I hear about the, 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 the next step after the course and all these things. You know, the course even says this book has, has this course has everything you need. I take that literally. I'm like, I felt it. I got, I got it and I said, yeah, I don't need a bunch of other books. I, I had all these books on my nightstand, you know, and I just, once the course came, I was like, okay, pack them up. I, I didn't even read the newspaper. I quit reading the comics. I quit reading the bubblegum wrappers, you know, the little <laughs> things, the little things. In, the course is enough. I, like you were saying, if you found something that you knew was the escape hatch, why not just put your full energy in it? I didn't have to be dillying around and, and trying to find anything else. So I knew when I picked up the course, and I just could feel it, I was like, oh my God, now I've got no excuses at all. I can't say, you could have been clearer, or you could have explained things better. You could have given me a systematic way to do it, instead of a hit or miss way of anything. That no, all my excuses were gone, and then I thought, good. Well, that's good too. That means I have to apply it now. I, I have to really get busy with it. So, yeah, it, I think that's the the thing that I take away from it is that, that it just it, it takes devotion and dedication, but it's also to me very simple. I took the course as like spirit speaking directly to me, not that there was other books published. And at the beginning of the Course, I used it more like an oracle, like I said, but while I was going through that process, I didn't know anyone else who was even studying the Course. 
it felt like just a direct connection to Source. And I had to be honest with myself, whether I was hiding, whether I was resisting, or whether I was eager and ready, I, it was like, it was like between Spirit and, and this character David. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't complicated. I am so glad that you, you, you said that, because I, I read the book for the first time probably about 10 years ago, and I felt the same way. I didn't really want to read it, and I haven't, but I, but I judge myself for it, and then I get heat. You know, I feel like I'm getting heat. Why haven't you read that book? What, what, about, what about this? Let's study this, let's study that. But my heart and my passion and my my wholeness of what I feel that I get the most from is that book. Only that book. And I, I don't have any other books in my house. And I, I, I was beginning to think there was something wrong with me. So now I have, I have, I have a friend that feels the same way I do. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up because I was beginning to think that wow, what's wrong with me? You know? Yeah, it's funny because you know, even though it's, I've had the course with me for like thirty years, it's like just recently, not too long ago, I started just opening and going in presence and reading a section and recording it and reading a workbook lesson, and then the spirit would have, have some more things to add with it and putting those out. And some someone wrote to me and says, "You mean after thirty years you're you're reading this book?" And uh, I said, "Oh, it's just an inspiration." Uh, and and other people have said, "Well, you know, the course you keep saying the course says seek not to change the world. Why do you travel to all these countries? What are you trying to actually do uh, by visiting all these countries and everything?" I said, "Oh, it's just involuntary. I'm just having fun. Uh, I, I'm not actually trying to like." convince anybody of anything or spread the word or whatever. It's just, I'm in my joy of just letting it come through in a very involuntary way. And the glee and the joy, you know, I, I always think our state of mind is really the teacher. Yeah. The words, you know, the words are just like the, the window dressing. They're just, they come along, they're added on. Mm -hmm. And besides, if you're not happy and joyful, then who would believe the words anyway? If somebody was teaching you something and they were really anxious and nervous and everything. I mean, even little children would probably go, like, what's wrong with him? Uh, you know, if there's not a sense of happiness, and the words are about happiness and you're not happy. So, to me, it's, it's all about integrity. Yeah. yeah, I think it's, it's best to be extremely simple with this, extremely simple. Like, I, it helped me after those first couple years immersing into the Course, and reading the words of Jesus, and then all of a sudden I had this stream of thoughts, just like Helen Shuckman had, and it was it was Jesus in my mind, telling me where to go, what to do. I mean, it's like, wow, talk about an easy life. I mean, that's the easiest thing, to go through a day with Jesus directing it. I mean, there's nothing easier than that. And what I found too, because it was so easy that, that Jesus would tell me things, and... Uh, I was, I think, you know, in my late 20s at that time, and then he came out one day and he said, uh, you're not going to have a career. And and it, I don't know about you, but late 20s, you know, it's <laughs> like to hear that. Maybe if he said it when I was like five or something, or or something like that, but, but late 20s, you know, that's like, those are your prime, you're thinking a lot about a career in the late 20s. And he said, no, you, you won't have a career in this lifetime. I thought, well, that's going to be interesting. I don't know how <laughs> you're going to pull that one off. But, but actually it's gone that way. Even, even when I came out here to San Francisco and Reverend Tony Ponticello, he invited me out and then he started inviting me to these big national conferences. I'm like the kid in the candy store. I show up at these big conferences and there's like 500 people. And, uh, a couple times I've had to speak in front of like, a, like 400 to 500 people and everything. And it's like sitting there talking to my grandmother. Um, it's got the, you know, it's just that heart-to-heart -heart kind of feel like, this isn't really a professional conference. I'm not really a speaker here, no matter what the, the flyers or the programs say or whatever. I'm there just having fun, enjoying all the holy encounters, 
with everybody I meet, and it's fun when you get 500 course students and teachers in the same hotel, uh, up and down the elevators, you know, people come out, oh, we're Facebook friends, you haven't met me yet, but I know you, or, or I watch your YouTubes, and I know everything about you, you don't know about me, but, but I like you, and this, and this. you know, it's just, it's fun, fun, it's just, but it's real simple, it's just the simple joy of holy encounters, as he calls them, the just connections. And then when you get up and they, they introduce you and then you look out and there's 450, 500 bodies, eh, it's just like speaking to yourself. It's just like speaking to one person. You know, it, it doesn't, it's not, the idea of a crowd, I don't even know what a crowd is. Uh, because it's, it's so intimate. That's what the experience has always been. Like Christ is right in our hearts, closer than our breath. It's so intimate. And when we stay with that intimate simplicity, that's it. You can really relax and enjoy and have fun, enjoy the ride, and, and it only when a self-concept thought comes of thinking you have to do the right thing, or say the right thing, or concern about how somebody feels, or whatever. Those are all just the chatter of the ego trying to take us out of this simple, peaceful experience. That's all your hand go up. Questions I had, but I was wondering, did you ever go through? I mean, when you start just started letting go and following guidance, did you ever? Did your mind like fight that? Did you go through any? I think you know, uh, Sanchez talks about you know our foot in two different canoes, and I find myself like I've been studying for about three years, and I was doing pretty well for a while, and then I started questioning things, and that part of my mind would come up a lot, and it has lately. But I was just wondering, since you were talking about your beginning experience with it, do you have any words of wisdom, or you went through anything like that? Yeah, I think, I think the struggle I seemed to go through was, I, I was all excited about trusting, mm -hmm. but it was like a deep, a deep thing to keep trusting, you know, it's, and keep deepening in that trust, and deepening. Mm -hmm. In fact, he's got a section in the manual for teachers called Stages of the Development of Trust. Mm -hmm. And I like that he put that in there, because, you know, even though he says at one point in the Course, trust would settle every problem now, okay, he's talking about the Holy Instant. <laughs> However, it's a Course in Miracles, it's not a Course in Holy Instant. It's not a Course in Revelation, it's a Course in Miracles. We need to prepare our mind, uh, because if we don't prepare our mind, and we don't take the steps that he offers us, he says in the, in the workbook that, that in the later part of the workbook, we will attempt a direct approach to God. And if you aren't prepared, then this direct approach will seem more traumatic than beatific. So, you know, it would be like if you were getting ready for a, like a chemistry test or a calculus test or whatever, and, and your professor said, now study, <laughs> just study before you go, go in there and take that final exam. It's like, it's not so much study for us with the Course, although that's helpful, but it's practice. Mm -hmm. I find it's, you know, the ego enjoys studying itself, he says. So, <laughs> yeah. so you know, when he said that, and I thought, oh, that, that insidious puff of nothing. <laughs> that clever, insidious puff of nothing. It did, here we've got a, all these 1,200 some pages to study, and now the ego enjoys studying itself. Well, that's, you know, you've got to be careful that you don't over-intellectualize the yeah. stuff. Because then it doesn't get you anywhere. So what, you can write books and do workshops and seminars, if you're not happy, who cares? <laughs> it's the ego <laughs> with a, a Course in Miracles self-concept. God, it's, this is a creepy, insidious thing, you know, it just tries to latch on to anything. Or a teacher of God, oh, now you're a teacher of God, you know, you know. And then the ego tries to make a concept out of that. Then you have to live up to that. And that's crazy. So. Yeah, it, it was, like I mentioned, when I was traveling in those early years, you know, where I would be trusting, following, trusting, following, and then you just, you have a doubt thought. You feel annoyed, you feel irritated, you, f you feel distracted, you feel bored, you, you know, it's, it's just going to try to take you off, off the beam, any way that it can. And then Jesus is practical, he's got that rules for decision section in there, in the back of this text, you know, where he, he says, decide the kind of day you want, and if you, 
make no decisions by yourself. This is the day that will be given you. That's real simple too. He has to add the other ones for when you forget that you want a happy day, which happens, you know. And it's like, oh, duh, that's right, wait a minute, wait a minute. This started out really good today, but it went really bad really quick. And then it spiraled. So, so I have found that, that I've just used the tools that he gave. I mean, I would really practice that that rules for decision, when I came to it very diligently, I would take that prayer that he's got, you know, at the beginning of the book, I'm here only to be truly helpful. Oh, did I use that on every time I'd go out to meet somebody, for groceries, laundry, course meeting, whatever. But every time I'd go through a doorway, before I'd go to the doorway, I would just silently reorient my mind. Like, oh, I'm here to be truly helpful, I'm here to represent who sent me. And that was important, because the ego was already, as I'd come to the doorway, it was always, I wonder who's going to be here at this meeting. I wonder if I'll see that one. Oh, that was a pretty girl. She was here last week, and I hope she's back again. What was her name? Okay, I am here only to be truly helpful. You know, you, you just have to, like, keep aligning and, keep, and be devotional about it, and then practice it, and practice it. And, you know, practice takes you into an experience. Devotion, you know, I, I thought, this is important. And at some point I thought, I really am worthy of happiness and peace and joy. I really am, and so this is important. And even with the ego chatter and the, all the temptations and doubt thoughts and everything, you know, I would, keep, no, this is important. This is too important for me to waste, waste a moment uh, on something else. Yes. It's, it's so wonderful we are talking about this because my mind has been going around this subject for a while now. I remember um, once I heard Adia Shanti say something like, if you have a problem facing you right now in life, don't sit and wait until you reach spirituality for that to solve it, for you, for you to get to a place where this no longer is a problem face it right then, because going through that will take you to where you want to go, you know, uh, like enlightenment. So that has always stuck with me, because often in life, when I had a, I had a problem facing me, I thought, no, I'm above this now, I'm not going to try to fight this or fix it or change it, you know, because then my ego is going to get really active and I'm not going to do it the right way. I don't trust myself anymore. I'm just going to wait until I find a way or something will come to me. And then, of course, the problem wasn't going away. But lately, <coughs> um, what has happened to me is that all of a sudden I had this insight that my biggest problem has been that no matter how much information I gathered, I was still identifying somehow myself, the self, with the mind, with the thinking mind. There was no separation. I was just trying to take this self, this mind, and make it enlightened so that I would no longer suffer. Even when you read the Course and then you start reading, there's a lot in there about the ego. And it's it's not just all love and light, it's really exposing and, and Jesus saying, well, you made the ego by believing in it and you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. But it you have to let it come to the surface of consciousness to do that. And and I just did a counseling call today and, and people go crazy when they start to see the defenses, they start to see their patterns. Uh, and that they never had seen before, and then they feel even more worse. Like, oh my God, I've been doing this to myself for years. And then they feel even more guilty. And I said, oh no, it's, a, it's just coming up into awareness, but that's, mm -hmm. that's a good step. And then there will come a step where you just see it for its nothingness. You know, you get really good at, at laughing at it, mm -hmm. but it's just part of the process. So I would say, it's like, I meet so many people who are doing the course, and they'll 
they do get from the Course that specialness is not good. And they do get from the Course that, that special relationships are, are of the ego. So they'll say, oh, I'm, I'm through with special relationships. I'm not going to ever get into another special relationship ever again. I'm going to be really careful and make sure I don't do that. And that's almost like a fish in the ocean saying, I'm through with the water as they're swimming through it. You know, it's like, it's the fabric of everything, of time and space. And this seeming personality self in this dualistic world is, is so all-pervasive that all you can do is call on the Holy Spirit and say, I'm going to give this to you, the whole thing. <laughs> I need really a lot of help. And then you use the specialness to unwind me from the specialness. In other words, when you try to go cold turkey on it, you know, it's like trying to go cold turkey, not on cigarettes or on eating cake or something, but cold turkey on the whole cosmos. Oh yeah, I'm going cold turkey. I'm quitting. <laughs> you tell your parents, I'm quitting the cosmos tonight. So I've had enough of it. You know, but that's actually, that's how pervasive and vast it is, you know. So, so there has to be a confidence and a, and a trust. Like I found, the more I trusted, the more light I felt, the more happy I felt, the more joyful I felt. It was a, it was a turning around of changing the purpose for the world from one of hatred mm. and fear and attack to one of forgiveness and, and love and peace. And that, all of us who have tried, like, even to, to lose weight or to quit smoking or quit drinking, you know, all of us who have tried to shift our behavior, it's behavior modification, know how difficult that is. Imagine trying to shift your mind that you've been addicted for millennium to fear and now suddenly you're going to flip over and become aligned with love. It's, it's a big turnaround. So we do need to be gentle with ourselves. We do, at times, we need to be vigilant. Uh, Jesus says, you're much too tolerant of mind wandering. When he said that, I said, okay, well then let's, let's pay attention here to the thoughts, pay attention to the emotions. Whereas I was so caught up in outcomes and forms and appearances, I wasn't paying attention to my state of mind. I would just gradually notice I was getting angry or upset. And then I'd say, where did that even start? I wasn't paying attention when those first judgments and comparisons first started to come in. And then you start to, you, you do need to gain a confidence. Like I developed with Jesus this thing called Instrument for Peace, where I developed like a 12-step a um, worksheet where it starts off with what, what you're perceiving, what you're feeling, what you're thinking, and so forth. And then it, it literally takes you through the steps with the Holy Spirit of getting in touch, like, oh, everything I, I think and perceive and feel is just a, a representation of what I want to believe to be true. What is that? I want to be right. What do I want to be right about? The whole cosmos in a fragmented way. You know, would you rather be right or happy? Would you rather be right about the way the ego set up the entire cosmos or be happy? And that has many specific applications. When we're talking to somebody and we want to be right, that's the same thing that's going on there. Do I want to be the author of reality or would I rather accept humbly that I was created by God? That every second of every day we're, we're working through that. Do I want to be the author of reality or was I created by God and I am a beloved child of a beloved creator? It, it can't be both, you know. And yet the ego wants to convince us that we can be the author of ourselves. Mm -hmm. We can make ourselves any way we want to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't, it never works. So I think you can, you know, you're not you're not going insane, you're going in towards sanity. It's inward towards the sanity. It's already insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, the ego, the whole system. In fact, in science, you know, it's the whole, the whole cosmos is, is moving towards chaos. And so that's a nice symbol, and we're pulling our mind away from identifying with the cosmos and with that 
that character and with that thinker in there. So, when you have something come up, I think you can notice it, and it, it could be an opportunity to choose again, that you do have the power of choice. And I think that's the, the workbook is, is really the, the application of the ideas. So, uh, it was almost like in science class, you know, where we read the text and then we get to go into the lab and play with the, the chemicals and mix the things and, and sh find out for ourselves you know, see what happens. And that's really the way the workbook is. Uh, it's, it's actually a meditation training, it's a mind training, it's uh, when you really put your faith in it, uh, you go for it so much and you start to have this feeling like, wow, this whole day seems to be in synchronicity with this lesson. And Jesus comes right out and says, if you'll do miracles, if you'll be a miracle worker, I will arrange time and space for you. Wow, nobody told me that. Mom and Dad never talked about <laughs> arranging time and space, you know. There are all these different career options, but there's one where, where time and space get arranged. I'm, oh, that's good. I want to go for that one. That sounds exciting. That sounds quantum. <laughs> uh, and so, and it happens. I mean, I had a raising the dead experience like Jesus had, where, where I literally watched a, a person who was dead uh, and the paramedics had stopped working on them, and then I felt all this energy, the third eye, and all this energy here, and, and my, my lesson was rolling through my mind. I was at a grocery store, and I kept hearing these words over and over in my mind, there is no death, the Son of God is free, there is no death, the Son of God is free. So when the raising the dead experience happened, which is not your typical human experience, I was like, yeah, it just was a perfect reflection of what was going on in my heart, in my mind. I was really giving myself over to that one. There is no death, the Son of God is free. And then the witness was there. When I was working on Lesson 136, you know, sickness is a defense against the truth. Wouldn't you know it, that was the day I had symptoms, you know, felt nauseous, felt then a diarrhea feeling, raced in on the toilet, was ready for the diarrhea experience, and all this and this and that. My lesson dropped in, sickness is a defense against the truth. See how practical, how orchestrated the symptoms, and then here comes the answer. Here comes the opportunity to practice on that particular lesson. So everything, when you do your lessons, you're really saying, you know, whereas in some systems you have a mantra, and that can be very effective, but also very repetitive. Jesus is mixing up the mantra 365 <laughs> ways. He's slicing and dicing. You know, he's like, and he, some of his lessons are longer, some are shorter, review lessons, you know. He's mixing it up, he's mixing it up. He's keeping you on your toes, you know, with it every day. Uh, I like that, you know. And the other thing I like about it is you can practice it as you move through the day, no matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter what your occupation is, whether you have children, whether you're single, married, it doesn't matter what continent you're on or whatever, you, you've got your one lesson a day. And it's almost like a torch, like he's saying, here we go, here I'm lighting the torch for you, and this will help you see through the darkness, and all you've got to focus on is this one lesson today. And he even gives you instructions for that know, how many times you should practice it, or time intervals, or all kinds of instructions. Or he'll say even, today we, do, we use but words to start the lesson. Then he's going to take you into a deep meditation. Maybe it's a guided meditation. At some point, he goes along and then he says, today we're going to uh, practice the, the, the most uh, effective meditation that there is. Try not to think of anything. There's no guided, guided meditation, there's no nothing, you know, he's just saying try not to think of anything. That's the most advanced meditation, is not to think of anything. But he doesn't start you there. He, he's got all kinds of lessons before that, just building you up, building your confidence, building your strength to come to that point where he's going to try that one on. So, I feel like 
that's a very much an important part of the of the whole program is is giving yourself over to that and I was really first I used it kind of as an I Ching and popped it open and then I would read a lot in the text uh, but then at some point it's like okay it's time to do the lessons and really give myself over what does it mean to give yourself over to the lessons I expected to wake up with every lesson. I was not interested when people would say, what lesson are you on? Uh, what about this one? Something they done in the future. I'm not interested in future lessons. I've got my lesson for the day. I'm uninterested. In fact, I might not even need them. I could wake up today. <laughs> I could wake up on number three. Wouldn't that be nice, huh? <laughs> Talk about cutting corners and coming back to heaven. Oh, I'm on number three. Yeah, I've got it. <laughs> Because he tells you at the beginning that the transfer of training with these lessons is not like transfer of training in the world. It's not cumulative. Yeah. In fact, if you can just forgive one person completely, see one person without any sense of the past, it transfers to the whole world. You forgive the stars, the black holes, the planets. You've, you've got one, one person you're working with, Aunt Jane, and you get it with Aunt Jane, you got it with everybody. <laughs> Uncle Fred, Black holes, stars, pixie dust, anything. You know, it's just going to transfer to everything. So that's why you go at it with such a fullness. It's not just like, oh, it's just part of my day, you know, there's, oh, brush my teeth and uh, do this, do that. Oh, yeah, the lessons, I'll squeeze that in there. No, that's got to be your gem, your jewel, your diamond, you know, because that's going to lead you through the whole day. And maybe right into enlightenment by by noon, uh, you know. For all you know, right? Who are you to say? You know, you want peace? <laughs> it could be today. So that's that's the way I approached it. And that's another one of those tips I tell people when you're doing the lessons: expect to wake up. Expect to, to wake up. Why would Jesus give you a promise and then not deliver? You know, and why should we? have such low expectations of ourselves, you know. That's just the past coming in trying to push us away. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um I have a question with you mentioned this sickness of the body, but um I was thinking if it's in the script that you're supposed to have cancer or some sort of horrible disease that's happening in your script and we don't change we don't change the script. Um but if you're like giving yourself over the Holy Spirit completely and things collapse in your, you know, time space collapses in your whatever, in your journey, um, can someone be completely at peace and still go through seeming some sort of disease of the body? Or does it just skip over? Well, the body is, is temporary and the body is like everything else is part of the, the cosmos and entropy, entropy in science is that the whole cosmos is moving to chaos mm -hmm. and so the body is part of everything else that's moving to chaos and it can appear in many ways, I mean certainly Jesus would be the prime example because uh, he, in, in his script we'll say there was a crucifixion scene and I I wrote and, that down as one of my questions was the crucifixion. Yes. And people have said to me, well, Jesus wasn't very enlightened because it was a bloody mess at the end. If, if an enlightened one would never have had such a bloody mess, uh, it would have been clean. Uh, like, why not just an ascension scene without the, without the crucifixion? So it was obviously in there for teaching purposes. Like it's this extreme teaching example that he didn't he didn't defend himself, he just went right, walked right into it, and went right through it. And he was very silent through the whole thing. But what I would say is, so the appearances are the appearances. The key to atonement, the key to salvation, the key to enlightenment, is, is right there even in lesson number one. Nothing I see means anything. That it's, a, it's actually impossible to interpret anything in this world that is specific, because the world of specifics was made by the ego as like a decoy and a distraction. 
And then even when we get into our questions around the body and the symptoms, yeah, just, somebody just wrote to me on Facebook the other day, and it's not the first time that they've written to me about Ramana Maharshi and his seeming tumor at the end of his life. You know, like somebody wrote something like, uh, I don't understand it. What, what, what was going on? If lesson number 10 is true, what's going on with Ramana Maharshi? This is the kind of Facebook questions I get. And, and what it is, is again, if, if the world is cracked perception, then what would the healing be? Holistic perception. Cracked perception is the problem, holistic perception is the answer. Holistic perception, though, sees the world as a whole. So it wouldn't pull out a thread called cancer or a thread called tumor. Uh, in the end, Jesus says, the, the problem of the sleeping mind is it has, doesn't know the difference of what is the same and what is different. So it's so, so, so simple, but only the Holy Spirit knows the difference between what is the same and what is different. The, the forms seem to all be different in this world. We seem to have many different forms, and guess what? They're all the same, because they're all illusions. That's what makes them the same. They're all temporary little manifestations that will be here and then gone. They're all illusions. And then, what is different? Well, what is different is the ego's thought system in your mind, and the Holy Spirit's thought system in your mind. They are different. In fact, they don't even have a meeting point, they're so different. But when you perceive yourself as a whole person, you think, oh, I'm a whole person. And you think, I'm a whole person that exists in a world of complexity and multiplicity. And Jesus is saying, no, you're not that either. You're a whole mind, and when you see that you're a whole mind, you'll perceive the world is whole as well. So, you see that that's the sickness, is the cracked perception. Cancer is no different than a rose, because a rose is specific and cancer is very specific. And holistic per perception just gobbles them all up. It's one blob, it's one unified perception. So, what we need to do to really accept the Atonement is we have to start to allow Jesus to retrain our mind to see, first of all, that all problems are mental. All problems are of the mind. All problems of consciousness. There's, there's not a single specific real problem there. It's just a distorted consciousness, a distorted perception. And there's enormous defense against recognizing that. The mind is asleep and dreaming, it would rather have cancer, it would rather have heart disease, it would rather call upon symptoms, it would rather tag the problem on the form than it would face the solution in the mind. That, and that's Sundari's song, what was it? Love, love me your solution. Love me your solution. That's, that's like the, the prayer of the heart. There's some great lessons in the Course that really deal with this too. It's like Lessons 79 and 80. Let me recognize the problem so it can be solved as number 79. It comes right in with number 80. Let, my re let me recognize my problems have been solved. But if you go and read in the text of those lessons, he'll say, even if you already have the solution, and you do, you won't be able to use it if you misdefine the problem. It's almost like taking a round peg and trying to fit it into a square hole. You think, this should work. Jesus gave it to me, it's a good solution here. Why isn't this working? It's like, because the mind is so bent on defining the problems in a specific way. And when they're defined in a specific way, they just keep repeating like Groundhog Day, over and over and over. Another form, another form. And isn't that our human experience, you know, as we go through a, a regular day, we have a set of problems, you know. We get up, we get all set to have our morning coffee, we're out of coffee. Oh, out of coffee, gotta go buy coffee. Put that on my list, buy coffee. How could I have forgotten that? And then you go out, and you're going to do this, and then you start to hit red lights, and you don't make it to work on time, late to work. And then, you know, it's just one specific thing after another. 
And, and Jesus says, you will never be able to solve all of these problems on that level. But you can solve them if you humbly say, you know, like they say in 12-step programs, Hi, my name's so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic. I say for Course in Miracles students, Hi, my name's so-and-so and I have a perceptual problem. <laughs> and you have to repeat this over and over, like they do in Alcoholics Anonymous, because why? Because you're not convinced. Yeah. If you still think you have financial problems, then you don't know you have a perceptual problem. Relationship problems, health issues, economic issues, issues with your house or your car or your dog or your spouse or whatever. Jesus is like, no, 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 no. I have a perceptual problem. He's like saying, come back over here with me. Because then you're going to come close to accepting his answer. If you can admit you have a perceptual problem, you can accept the answer, the atonement for a perceptual problem, and all these other ones will be gone too. But when you focus on all the little ones, they never end. We know that from the human experience. It just goes on another day, and I don't know, another set, another set, and here comes another set, you know. And that's why people commit suicide. That's the number one cause of death in the world, because people get so frustrated with all of these complex set of problems that eventually they just get tired, you know. They just get, they say to God, you know, this thing is just getting really old, and I can't do it another day. So I'm just going to end it. But it doesn't. It doesn't end it. And Jesus says the ego will pursue you beyond the grave. <laughs> you try to kill yourself to get out from underneath it and it's coming after you. It's worse than Freddy Krueger. You know, it's, it's, it's not giving up. No, no, oh, kill yourself. It's just like, good, good. Then I'll just keep torturing you some more. There'll be more. So that's why we need to to practice the mind training. Mm -hmm. To me that's good incentive, like if I, am I going to go through all that or, or go for the solution, I'm ready to go for the solution. I'm ready for some happiness, you know, that's the way it was in my life. Wouldn't that be nice if we had a recycling system when everybody could throw their ego in it and they would close them <laughs> and then they would just recycle it? <laughs> well that's a version of what they tried to do in the, in the Bible, the Old Testament. We got the word scapegoat. They all, it was so difficult, life on planet Earth, that they, at the end of the year, the high priest, Aaron the high priest, would gather all the sins of the village, and then they'd put them on the head of this goat. they just get a goat. they put them all the sins of the whole village on the goat, and then they'd chase the goat out of the village. And that's where we get scapegoat from that. So this is another version, it's like a recycle, this is more the California version. <laughs> it's a recycling bin, we've come all these years from, from the Bible and centuries, now this is the modern day California. Let's recycle it and be done with it. <laughs> but it, it doesn't work. Gia's got another question. I have a question about this idea of neutral, like feeling neutral, like, and in, I know in the lessons, you know, I have no neutral thoughts. And I, in one of my retreats, someone had mentioned, yeah, I feel neutral about this. And I was thinking, does that, is it possible to feel neutral about something? You know, I look at the flowers and I'm like, oh, do I feel, I feel kind of neutral about the flowers. Like, is that possible? Well, <laughs> only in atonement is, is there an experience of this unification, which could be equated with neutral. But when he's saying, I, I have no neutral thoughts, I see no neutral things, He's saying the sleeping mind is, is addicted to judgment in a major way. It's seeing everything in terms of positives and negatives. Um, and so, it's, the, when the mind's asleep, it, it doesn't see things neutral. Now that, the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit is, when it says, nothing I see means anything, it's because nothing in perception does mean anything to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's just using all the symbols almost like leaves blowing in the wind. They, you know, they're just neutral symbols, but the spirit can use them to unwind the mind out of this addiction to ordering and sequencing the symbols in a linear way. Linear time and eternity, Jesus says time and eternity cannot coexist, and it makes sense. One was, is made up 
and one's real. <laughs> and the unreal one is has got to finally, the darkness of the unreal one of linear time has to give way to I amness, to eternity. So, so those lessons are, are good at just starting to pay attention to see how there's a charge with everything and even if it's, if it can be kind of pushed out of awareness, like the princess and the peas, if you've got enough mattresses in there, you can say, it's neutral to me, but there's a lot of mattresses there, there's a lot of defenses, there's a lot of guarding against things. People say, well, what's the fastest way to enlightenment or self-realization? I say, well, relationships and silence. Hopefully you can have a lot of relationships and silence in your life, because relationships do the mirroring, and you need the mirrors to be aware of all this unconscious stuff. And the ego doesn't like stillness. You know, be still and know that I'm God. It's, oh, it doesn't like meditation at all. So if you have a meditation practice, and you're practicing in relationships with all your relationships, you're really on the super fast track. And what that does is it just gets you more in touch with where those charges are, which is positive negative. So, for example, specialness is really preferences. So as long as there's preferences, then there's specialness. What's the way out of that? You can't take a stand on it without just saying, here Holy Spirit, I offer my specialness to you so you know me very well. You know my reality and you know my insanity. I want you to use my insanity, my preferences, which is judgments. There's no preferences in heaven because there's nothing to prefer. <laughs> just absolute oneness. Use those preferences and take me higher and higher in consciousness all the way back to nirvana or to heaven. And therefore, I say to people, relax a bit and have some fun with this thing. You know, have fun with the Holy Spirit every day. Even the things that you prefer, the Holy Spirit can use very well. I've had people who have traveled with me and one, Lisa was a smoker. You know, she liked to smoke, 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 and smoke a lot. So when we went on these miracle trips, you know, we would stop at a restaurant, there'd be, there'd be smoking section and non-smoking section. So, I could tell that she had a tremendous fear of giving up the smoking. That was one of her major preferences. So every time they'd come out, the major deal smoking, I said, we'll, we'll have smoking. We'll go smoking, smoking, smoking. I would go and do gatherings, and, and there would be a group of smokers that would come out of the, the gatherings I was doing, and Lisa would be out there smoking with the smokers. And, and sharing the miracle, sharing the insights. You see this, and she came to me after a while, she said, I can't believe it, the Holy Spirit uses cigarettes. Because <laughs> in her mind, it, that was like, those were the cancer sticks, you know. The Holy Spirit's not going to be using cancer sticks, you know. Oh, the Holy Spirit uses whatever you believe in. The Holy Spirit uses food, the Holy Spirit uses houses, like right now. <laughs> all kinds of things. When you say, help me, to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will use everything that's part of the, the egoic preference system of the mind to take you up and out. And then you get a lot of whims. When you start following the Holy Spirit, you know, there's things that you really like, and they start showing up without your effort, without you going and buying them. I travel a lot, so I've been traveling, you know, for the last 25 years, I call them whims. You know when you have something like, uh, whatever, red licorice that you like, and you go and you're staying with a host, and they come out and they bring out the red licorice, you know, I just smile, because I didn't buy the red licorice. It's just, it's dealt to you, it's given. And it's almost like a way of the Spirit saying, I know you're coming to me, and here's a little cute one for you, here's another little one. We get those little whims. Yes. So David, I, I mean, I, I keep hearing about um, joy and happiness, and I remember watching a video of you on YouTube, and someone mentioned something regarding, I need to do nothing, and um, so I think they asked you a question, like, why do you eat? And you said, because it brings me joy. And whatever, that hit me, and I keep hearing this thing about happiness and peace and joy, that's really the end goal, to get that's where you are. And, but I've been struggling with this whole thing because 
there's things that I do to bring you joy, but they're, they seem to be conflicting in life. Like, I, I enjoy writing. It's something about therapeutic for me, and I lose a sense of time. And, um, but yet I have to work and do the normal things to pay the bills and take care of the family. So I struggle with this, but every time I, do, when I, when I write, when I do things that bring me joy without any expectation, it's, only, it's a meditation. And I, and I feel that that's inspiring, but I just, I guess I'm stuck in trying to figure out, is it okay? Is it okay that, that, I'm, that this makes me, that I feel that I'm happy doing this, but I'm not, I don't get married to it. In other words, if I don't, if I don't write, I still have a good day, because I have, I'm, you know, I have Christ, I have, I have Holy Spirit. So, I, but I keep, but t tonight I keep hearing this whole thing about, it's all about being, you know, the, the peace. If you want to be right, you want to be happy. So this is something again I'm struggling with, and I'm ask, I'm going to spirit asking. When I write, I lose a sense of time, I, and, and there's 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 lessons in that. Um, I wrote a book years ago. I had a so-called agent, multi-million dollar deal. Dreams come true, right? Everything was there until right before the release of the book, and my agent supposedly she got a, a nervous breakdown, never recovered. I pushed all my chips in, as I say in poker. And it all fell apart, I lost everything, you know? I mean, I lost every material thing. And from that, I stopped writing. And I've been writing since I was a kid. That was that was my way of expressing myself. It was something that I just did, and therapeutic, and then it just hit me but as I've been studying the course more and more deeply. It seems like Spirit's telling me, listen, that brings you joy and peace. That's closer to, why did you stop doing that? Mm -hmm. It's because that monetary gain was gone. And that was the ego part of that process. So now where I'm at now is I keep bringing that up. It's like, you know, I, I'm working with spirit trying to, I want, I want, I want peace. You know, and I don't want it necessarily that writing is the only, if I don't write, I want to still have that peace and happiness. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I know that I, I'll do those things if it, if it brings me closer. And like you said, you do this because it brings you joy. I mean, that, that makes sense. So that's kind of where I'm kind of stuck in terms of what's, you know, how do I, you know, he, he had asked about the ego and spirit. How do you know what, how you're being guided? You're getting inspiring thoughts. How do you know that's not the ego, or what? You know, what, what is the difference? You know. Yeah, so that's kind of, good. That's a real good question because that's now we're getting down to purpose. Like if if we if there's a desire for joy and there's a purpose that takes you to joy, and then there's another purpose in the mind that that blocks you from the joy, then the discerning between the helpful purpose and the unhelpful purpose is key, mm -hmm. which is the difference between listening to the Holy Spirit and the ego. It's a major lesson in, in awakening. So one thing I could say is there's a line in the Course that says, all real pleasure comes from doing God's will. And the ego made up all kinds of distractions in this world. Sometimes they're called temptations, but there is an enormous array of distractions to keep the mind from finding its joy. And there's a there's actually a, a workbook lesson that says, my happiness and my function are one. The ego associates all kinds of outcomes and pursuits and goals achieve that and you'll be happy, except when you get there, it, you're not. And then it quickly shifts and says, oh, well try this over here then. And then you achieve that and you're still not happy. And then it's, oh, but what about this? It's always shifting the goals. It's almost like turning a diamond with all these shimmering lights. And it keeps turning and turning and turning, hoping that the mind will follow its pursuits and seek and do not find. Seek in the form and do not find. It just it goes on and on and on. So there's no joy in that. So I would say um, it's helpful when you take a look at like the body. The ego made the body, so now the Holy Spirit can use what the ego made. So now the Holy Spirit can use the body. The Holy Spirit uses the body solely as a means of communication. The ego uses the body for pride, for pleasure, and for attack. I love it when Jesus tells me, okay, that's pretty clear. One communication is going to take me back to joy, and pride, pleasure, attack are, are going to keep me in the death spiral. 
And that's a very clear thing. And so I would go into deep prayer and just say, show me all the ways that, that I have been using this body for pride, for pleasure, for attack. And there's a lot. It's just a lot. It's like when you go through the workbook lessons and he starts you know, going through the laws. Uh, I'm under no laws but God. He gets very specific in lessons 50 and 76. Very helpful. You know, because he's, he's going to be very specific and he's going to say, this isn't serving you, this isn't serving you. You need to trust the Spirit, you need to be in alignment with Spirit, you need to be in your function to find the joy. In fact, you need to be so in your function that everything else fades away. You let thine eye be single. You, you get so in, enraptured in this purpose that, that you're just taken to heights of happiness. More joy, more, even more joy, more consistent joy as you go that way. So I'm glad that you brought up the writing because writing is, is definitely a means of communication in terms of this world and it's something that Jesus and the Holy Spirit need. In fact, Helen Schuckman spent seven years with shorthand, taking down shorthand dictation because the dictation was so rapid and then her collaborator helped her, they typed it out you know, into what became our Urtext, and then eventually got edited down to the published course, which is a tremendous use of, of writing. I mean, one of the highest uses of writing, to, to have an escape hatch <laughs> penned <laughs> for the entire human race. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. I have a friend who's a Course in Miracles teacher uh, down in Los Angeles, Bridget, and, and I didn't get a chance to meet with her on my most recent trip, but on the way to the airport, I, I called her and we were talking and she was like a little girl, she was so excited. She said she's always loved writing and Jesus, in, her, in prayer, Jesus has said, I'm going to start writing through you. And so she's been getting up in the early hours of the morning. She's being w awakened, woken up at night and then she just, you know, starts writing. and. Um, she says, oh, I'm so excited, because there's, it just feels like that's, she's excited to see what's going to come through, realizing it's all for her, her own mind training and all for her path. So that's really the answer in the sense of, it, it will be an increasing lesson in discernment of really being inspired with what you do inspired by the Holy Spirit, and then the, the state of joy will come from that. Because the ego's joys don't last. They, they come and they go. Basically, there's a part in the workbook that says uh, that, uh, that their joys are gone in this world before they can be possessed or even grasped. So they're so fleeting. And that's because the ego is sponsoring a substitute joy. It makes a substitute, and the spirit has an actuality, like a true joy, that's in there. So this, this is like going to be an ongoing thing, I think, where you just get clearer and clearer and clearer in your mind of what it is that truly inspires you. And it will unify your mind as well, because the Spirit takes care of everything. If you've got a family to feed, if you've got duties, responsibilities, and so forth, even though it was the ego that set them all up. Like in heaven you don't have any lacks, you, have, you don't have any duties, responsibilities, just this bliss and being. Even though the ego set them up, the Holy Spirit will unwind you from everything that the ego made, if you tune in and listen. So it sounds like, I think the writing will be a big part of that. Like that's something that's been there, and it was just a traumatic experience with pouring so much in and having it all, you know, just fall away. That that was just a, like the ego trying to really make you down on writing and push it out of awareness. I mean, I recognized it, and one of the things about it that again, I appreciate you being here. I mean. Seriously, this is this is very powerful. Something I needed to. Uh, I mean, we all obviously need to hear. But uh, something about the writing, the theme that I since I was a kid was separation. 
And I didn't get that until I went back recently and read these stories. It doesn't matter who the character is, fiction, short story, West, whatever it is, it's about a separation from a, a father figure and a child. Mm-hmm. And it hit me as like, oh, this is all about stuff. I mean, I didn't know my, my biological father, so there's always... So I thought it was that's what it was about, but then when I went with Spirit, and I said, Spirit, what is this all about? And that's the message I'm getting that I need to write, but the ego keeps creeping in, like trying to control it. But uh, wow, it's, uh, I mean, I can see that as that's what, that's what my, con- my the suffering and conflict is because I believe you know, that the only problem is we feel we were separate from our source, from God. And that is the theme in everything I've written since the time I was, you know, four or five years old, and I didn't get until I went back and started reading this stuff. I was like, "Wow, very, very powerful." Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just want to make sure I'm consistent with. Yeah, I'm consistent with that. So. Yeah, it's beautiful. In fact, it's just dawning on me now because I was happily down in Mexico, very content, and I, I remember going through my Facebook messages, and and one of the messages was from you. Mm. Hi, my name's Ty. And there was the writing, you, and that's that's really got me up here to Northern California. Before anything was put out and anything like this, I had I had a, a young man in um, in Topanga Canyon, Zakaria, and then you saying, "My name's Ty, my wife, we're up here," and you know, and and that kind of I was like, mm, I could feel something swirl under that. So it was actually you writing that, that was the first line. Hi, my name is Ty, and you introduced me. Is it your wife Jess, Jessica? Jessica? Yep, you introduced, and then you went on, and then that got the conversation going, and then and, and though we found out you were over in, is it Tracy? Yeah, the yeah. Little, it's, so it was like, okay, and then talking and saying, well, there's, we'll see how it goes, but then it evolved that you would come here to Sundari's house, but so that's interesting that the writing even got used <laughs> for all of us to be here yeah. in the room right now. It, it, it's, it's quite amazing, you know, that you, you followed it. There was a, some kind of prompt or something and you, you wrote it out. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, Jesus is, sometimes I call Jesus like the master psychologist because he, he explains what's going on in our minds, he, he explains causation, and he even has a beautiful line where he says, what you do comes from what you think. And then he goes on to say, we must work with your thoughts, because you can try to make corrections at the level of form and the doings, but, but they don't ever last, because they're effects, behaviors are effects, and, and our thoughts are causative. So it's really beautiful. and. And, uh, you know, really kind of what you're sharing is, is almost paraphrasing, you know, the famous quote from St. Augustine, love and do what you will. It's coming to the purification, having our thoughts purified, so we're thinking with God. We're thinking, my mind holds only what I think with God. We're in alignment with the Source, and then the doing flows automatically like that. And that's why when people say, you know, why do you travel? Why do you eat? I was actually in Dallas, Texas when <clears throat> I attended this big gathering in this big house and it was an Indian man and his wife and his name was Arvind and oh my gosh, the cakes, the double and triple decker cakes and the potlucks, this was like a, a, a lively course community that everybody would bring this massive food for the potluck. And so they would have them all, we would, morning sessions, we'd get there at lunch, and all the food's out and everything, and then Arvind would, before we would start, he would be very contemplative. David, 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 all this food, all this food, why do we eat? Every time we take a piece of food, we are reinforcing the separation from God. Every single piece of food. You know, and this is a massive, there's pies and cakes and everything. And he's the host of the house, the Indian. Why do we eat? We are reinforcing the separation with every bite of food. And I said, Arvind, I said, uh, uh, there has, there's another way. Uh, there's, there's just another way. And, and he says, okay everybody, 
David, that's another way for us. Uh, and it's a good thing because there's a lot of food, you know. And, and, and reinforcing the separation with every bite is not something that this course community was actually excited about. You know. So then he said, okay, David, tell us. Why shall we eat today? What is the reason? Why shall we eat? And I said, we shall eat for joy. And then everyone, ah! <laughs> Everybody went in. And you should have seen it was a happy crowd, you know? Because it's orienting it, orienting it, you know? The, the joy is the purpose. It's not, once we start to break it down and think we have all these reasons for it, then it gets really intellectual and, you know, you could make a case for anything. But, and so I've kept that in mind, you know, why do I travel? I travel for joy. Why do I communicate, you know, do it for joy? You know, we actually can be done through, you know, Jesus says, it cannot be difficult to do the task that Christ appointed you to do, for it is He who does it. He, that's what you were just saying, it's He who does it. It's, it's an alignment with the will of God, and therefore it's fun. And I find this fun. I've been doing this for 25 years, and I'm not bored. I'm sitting here and just, I'm enjoying myself. It's not like I reach a point where I'm going, oh, this is it. I can't say these words anymore. <laughs> you know, and this and this and this. I, if I have those moments, I'm just in silence, just enjoying the quiet and the bliss. But, but it's involuntary, you know. And imagine if that was your career, to have joy. You may, that just was never in our career options, you know. Mom and Dad got to the table, okay, what do you want to be when you grow up, and what do you want to do? Joy! <laughs> you know, that, now, now let's be practical. No, that, that is practical, that is very practical. It's highly individualized, I mean, you know, the, like somebody called me, I mentioned this down in Southern California, where this man called me from Portugal, and he's 23, and, and uh, he's having these mystical experiences, and then he's having pain, in his body, and, and he's losing all five senses. It's just all five senses are, are going. So it's, and we talked and, and had a great joining, and he, it, mainly he was saying underneath it all was, I just want to know that I'm not abandoned by love. That was like the core thing. So yeah, the curriculum is highly individualized for everyone, and, and it's, it's one of those things where you just give it over every day, and, and what inspires you, it's the purpose underneath there, then what comes, it's just so fun, it's so joyful, there's not even a sense, like, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's forgetting the doer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that just becomes so, so natural, and, mm -hmm. and eventually all things of this world will pass away, but, but they will come, just like with your retirement, mm -hmm. the time like, hmm, it is time. Yeah. Or Yogananda, when he laid aside his body, you know, when it was time, he just, he told everybody at, at supper, <laughs> it's been nice, <laughs> and nobody saw that one coming either, you know. So it's great, it's beautiful that you can just be inspired like that. interesting that, like you said, that spirit can use anything um, in this world, even though spirit sees it as neutral, as a um, way to bring you back, or to awaken you, mm -hmm. bring you back home. Um, my question for you is, did you use movies that you, on um, topics or issues that you always had a, that conflict with, as a way to... For example, if there's something, let's say it's a topic that always bothered you that you tried to avoid, would you use movies as a way to, you know, working with spirit? Yeah, I think the spirit really did that with me. It, it was like, first they were kind of light movies, and it was very lighthearted and, and humorous and joyful, romantic comedies and so forth, and then as I continued on, uh, the spirit would take me to the movies over and over and over to face things that... Yeah, I didn't want to look at, didn't want to see, would trigger things in my consciousness and so forth. And and I think that was also, I saw movies as modern day parables, 
because it's like more of an audio video version, an audio visual version of, of the words uh, that were acted out. And, and a lot of times people, there are people that are more verbal or more into words and, and there are others that are much more into sounds and music and images and everything. And a lot of movies they bring in it, all of that. So when I had people that started to follow my teachings and really, I, I would say, leave the world in their mind, just go deeper and deeper and deeper into these experiences, um, part of what they did was was we put together an online program called Mystical Mind Training that was had all components. It had meditations, it had verbal, it had writings in it, but it had movie clips, um, music, and all kinds of things. And and that kind of package of audiovisual and and writings and everything has been very helpful for people. And then the movies just kept coming and coming because when I set up a movie and I have Holy Spirit commentating during the movie, it's almost as powerful as like a drug experience for somebody. People sometimes come and they kind of spring, during some of my movies have sprung into mystical states, or they will just reach very blissful states. I see Sundari, there's a couple of movies, what was it? Uh, Lucy, is it Revelations? So it's like a, a very high use of these movies in a very directed way from the Holy Spirit. And, um, or I think Lila had an experience, she was literally floored on the floor from working with the Mystical Mind Training Program at one of the modules. So these are all ways of accelerating the awakening. And especially I put it down in the book, The Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. Uh, I don't know if we might even have some of this here, but then we put it online. So it was online Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, where people could watch movies, movie clips, setups, and so forth. And then we put an emotional index and correlated it with the movies. So people now are using this as their pathway to God, just like people use scripture, meditation, David's movies. Uh, what's your pathway to God? Movies. Uh, <laughs> And then I'm serious, they are using them. It, it's growing more rapidly than anything else that I've done, where people are tuning in. I, I would hold these, I mentioned at lunch today, six-week retreats, devotional retreats. And basically I would just stand back and it was all set up and there was lots of mind training and collaboration and projects during the daytime. But then after dinner, once every night I would show a a chosen metaphysical movie with commentary, and after six weeks of that, of movie conditioning, people were in very different states of mind than when they came in. One woman came into the retreat, was diagnosed with cancer, didn't know where to go and everything. She came into the devotional, she was in remission by the time the devotional retreat was done through this uh, high use of mind training and so forth. So, it is quite amazing that all these different ways are coming into us now and, and we're, it's getting much more direct and much more focused. And a lot of people around the world, they just enjoy watching movies. They feel relaxed, they, they don't feel like it's their, it's so much their lesson like they feel in their relationships, like it's right on them all the time, on, on top of them. When they see it acted out in the characters, then they go, ah, oh, oh look at it, oh, they start to realize, oh, that's my lesson. And they just got a healing that occurs during the movie. So some of them will like, if they have anger issues, jealousy issues, whatever their pattern is, they'll go online, they'll go into the in emotional index, they'll find their emotions that they're going through right now, and then there will be recommended movies to watch. And this is on your website? Yes, it's oh, all, please. there's all kinds of stuff out there. This is like the tip of the iceberg. But it's one of the most popular uh, things that people do. Uh, you do books too? I, I oh. do books. I've, <laughs> books have come through, not that I've written them, but I speak I them and they get transcribed and, and put in books. They're very practical, like... One of the books was when I was working with students on all kinds of issues and we would trace it from the presenting problem back into the mind 
and back into the Holy Spirit where it would disappear. So I would do this in a practical way. The, yeah, the book is like 500 and some pages. It's, uh, but it's very practical. It's almost like the how. Like people say, well I read the Course, or I read all these books, or I listen to these cassette tapes or DVDs, but as far as practically applying it to my mind and my situation, how do I do that? And I say, well, the Holy Spirit is the how. However, since I've done it with so many people, people can learn through those experiences. So this big book, Unwind Your Mind Back to God, is for many people is turning into the how. They're actually forming Unwind Your Mind groups. They do online Unwind Your Mind groups. We have the Movie Watchers Guide to Enlightenment. They're doing online retreats now where people can simultaneously in different parts of the world watch the same movie at the same time through this Zoom uh, software that we use and then they can join in discussions even though they live in different parts of the world or remote parts. The MMT, the Mystical Mind Training, you get, a, you get assigned a, a mind training partner. I think you've had, you and V are both, you live pretty close to each other so you're in the <laughs> walking distance. But for some it's, it's, it's more digital, it's online. So there's a huge range of tools that have come from me doing this over the past 25 years. And these are very practical tools. These are like hands-on kind of things that you can really sink your teeth into and practice. And that's been fun. I feel like that was part of my assignment was, first of all, to forgive and get happy. And then when you get happy and joyful, then the Spirit uses that to to reach people wherever they seem to be in terms of this, this world, in a practical way.